Jackson. Senator Marco Rubio, thank you very much for joining me here on The Morning Show. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. We have a number of things to cover this morning. Let me start with the ongoing confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson. You said after meeting her uh, and after your conversation, it did nothing to ease your concerns because you, you two have starkly different understandings of the Constitution and, and the role of the Supreme Court. Now, I know you said you would keep an open mind until after the hearings end, but you'll likely vote against her nomination. What might possibly change your mind? When it comes to Supreme Court nominee, really it isn't whether we like the person. Most of the people that are nominated to the Supreme Court are not just likable, but incredibly intelligent, very talented, uh, great personal stories. And that's certainly the case uh, here. Um, and she actually ended up going to high school, was in high school, graduated a year ahead of me, just you know, in a rival school just down the street. So it's a story that's familiar to me. And I don't know her personally, except for our meeting, but I like her very much as a person. And she's clearly incredibly intelligent and has a very inspiring story. You have to separate that from what I believe the Supreme Court justice's job is. I believe their job is to apply and to interpret and apply the Constitution according to its original meaning, according to the plain text and what it meant to the people who wrote those words. And I need to look and see in her record, not just her words, but her record, whether she has a history of doing that. And in particular, whether she understands that the role of the Supreme Court is to be a trier of law and we need to apply the law, irrespective of whether you agree with the outcome or not, and not to try the facts, which is what a trial court does. And, uh, and in my meeting with her, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit. I didn't get the answers. I wasn't surprised, but I didn't get the answers that I thought. I'll watch very closely. I expect she'll do very well and be treated very respectfully. I anticipate she will be confirmed because she's got the votes for confirmation. But it's, uh, for, for me, it's going to be difficult to be supportive. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want to stay that, stay that just yet because I do want to see the entire hearing and see what comes of it. Switching topics, let me ask you about the Russian war with Ukraine. President Biden traveling to Europe to meet with the uh, leaders of the NATO allied nations. At the end of the day, given what we know is President Putin's actions, basically a war of attrition at this point, do the NATO allies right now have to rethink their options, perhaps a no-fly zone, perhaps putting more options on the table? Well, I think that the NATO response right now is working. I mean, in terms of you see that the Ukraine has now been able to retake and go on the offensive. And all of that is because of the NATO supplies that continue to flow into the country. They've received an extraordinary amount of supplies and continue to put them to good use. And so I think that's worked. The, the no-fly zone, it's not that I don't want a no-fly zone. I'd love to have a no-fly zone. The problem is that no-fly zone isn't some FAA declaration. It isn't just some ruling you put out there. To have a no-fly zone, you have to go into Russia and Belarus. You have to knock out the surface-to-air missiles. You have to attack Russia, basically. And then you have to shoot down Russian planes. And by the way, you'll have a few of yours shot down as well because their surface-to-air missile systems are, are pretty advanced. Uh, this is not Syria or Iraq or you know one of these other parts, Afghanistan, that didn't have it. So I think people need to understand the no-fly zone equates to war between the United States and Russia, whether we want to call it that or not. Mariupol has been reduced to ashes. Much of Ukraine right now is, is crumbling. How much longer does this go on? How many more cities have to tumble? Well, I think that's exactly what Putin's new strategy now is, and that is to lay siege to five or six key cities, try to capture the coastal north, because he definitely wants to turn the Black Sea. He wants to turn the Black Sea into a Russian lake, and then basically lay siege, encircle a bunch of other cities, including Kiev, pound them with artillery and mortar fire and some strategic air weaponry, and, and, and just until he believes he's developed enough of a leverage to force Ukraine into a negotiated settlement that includes you know, forfeiting lands like Crimea and the Donbass, putting neutrality in their constitution, demilitarizing. Is he desperate enough to use chemical weapons? And if he does, what do the NATO allies do? Understand this, if, if he believes that some humiliating loss in Ukraine will endanger his grip on power and his government stability, he's capable of doing things that are unimaginable, even beyond what he's already done. And as far as our response, we'll have to wait and see exactly what it is we're talking about. But some of these chemical or biological agents don't respect borders. Uh, it can spread across borders and impact neighboring countries, including members of NATO like Poland. And at that point, I think the equation becomes different. I wouldn't speculate on what the response would be, but it will have to be one.